Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Kabir Considers. In this video we're going to react to the United States versus North Korea 2024. Like North Korea is one of those countries that I think most people know that they're, they're not on good terms with the USA. To be honest they're not on great terms with the West but I think the USA in particular is like um, in their eyes like an, one of their enemies basically. Um, but we don't really know much about North Korea. I think they've been trying to, they, they either have a nuclear weapon or they've been trying to get one for a long time or, or they've been testing one. I'm not really sure. I don't think like realistically, if they were to like challenge the US, you know, into some kind of war or conflict, I don't think they would win. Obviously I'm not an expert though. I've never served in, in the military, but you know, I think it's well known the US military is like the number one military in the world in terms of, uh, you know, equipment, weapons, things like that. But you never really know, like you just don't know what these countries, unless you're, you've got like, um, you know, a mole in there who's telling you exactly what they have. You can't really say for sure if you would defeat someone or a country in a battle. So yeah, this video should be quite a an interesting uh, thought exercise just to see what would happen, how the two sides stack against each other. Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un has recently shaken up his military cabinet while warning that the military must be prepared for imminent war. What does Kim know that but we don't why, or is this more bluster? And if war were to break out, just how effective would the North's military be against the South-US alliance? Military shakeups are nothing new in the highest echelons of power in the North Korean military. In fact, Kim Jong-un regularly shuffles around senior personnel, sometimes for perceived failures, but most of the time to keep any one individual from amassing too much power. After all, as a dictator, Kim Jong's greatest threats come from within. However, it was a chilling warning that the North Korean military should be prepared for imminent war that made- I love how they've made him like quite skinny here when in reality he really isn't. <laughs> take notice of this shakeup. The nation spends around $4 billion on its military every year, or about 25% of the country's entire GDP. Four That's about billion. what the US will spend on a single military program given its vast $800 billion defense budget. Its weapons are largely no antiquated, way, training is considered to be poor to non-existent, and its logistics are believed to be even worse than Russia's, which is really saying something. Yet the punch the North Korean military has might just surprise you. By the numbers, there's really no comparison between the two powers. The only area where there's even remote parity is in the total number of active duty personnel. North Korea has around 1.2 million active duty personnel versus wow. the US's 1.39 million. That's a bigger number than I thought, to be fair. Much bigger. When it comes to reservists, North Korea enjoys the advantage with over 600,000 versus the US's 442,000. But there's a bigger story here than numbers. Quite US even. soldiers are far better trained and equipped than their northern counterparts. The US Army alone is spending four times the total North Korean military budget on readiness and training in 2023-2024. In total, the US Army, Marines, Air Force, Navy, and Space Force are spending over three times the entire GDP of North Korea on training and readiness. What's the point of the Space Force though? Because we're not really having battles in space yet. so. Like, what do, what do they do? Is it surveillance? Fiscal years of 23 and 24. This training includes individual and unit training, as well as large-scale combined arms exercises with partner services and foreign allies. The US trains how it fights, adopting the maxim that it's better to sweat in training than bleed in war. And the results are reflected in the one-sided loss ratios experienced by the US military. North Korean training is largely conducted at the unit level, with each unit responsible for individual proficiency. With very, very few exceptions over the last decades, a large-scale training exercise involving large formations or combined arms operations are non-existent. Further, a lack of budget plagues North Korean units the way it does Russian units. For Money soldiers talks, not man. in special Money units, talks. typically those in the capital or with ceremonial purposes, training can be altogether non-existent. Hunger is also a constant concern, with Hunger. two or three potatoes per meal or raw corn kernels or corn rice making up the vast majority of meals per northern defectors. This oh directly God. results in what's been termed the shrinking North Korean army, where northern soldiers on average are several inches shorter than their southern counterparts. Training is also typically superseded wow. by labor-intensive tasks. So, so they don't get to eat protein, basically. That's sad. That's, that's kind of sad, isn't it, really? 
Soldiers are used for general labor, assisting farmers in rice paddies or in constructing roads and other infrastructure. Corruption also eats away at the North Korean military, though not at the scale of the Russian military. Corruption tends to be localized to the top leadership, with rank-and-file soldiers being made example of for committing the same acts their commanders are guilty of, and this typically means imprisonment, beatings, or death. Malnutrition is such a significant problem in the North Korean army that soldiers are regularly sent home to recover from its effects. Once they're healthy once more, they're rounded up to complete their mandatory military service. Yikes. Defectors have claimed that sometimes soldiers simply starve to death during their service, what though there the are instances of good commanders looking after their troops and keeping them healthy, preventing this from occurring. Typically, hunger is so prevalent that soldiers have a notorious reputation for stealing anything edible that they can get their hands on. I mean, I have to think that most North Koreans, deep down, aren't happy living like this. Obviously, I can't speak for them, but you're starving. All the while, you're, under, you're, you're living under this dictator who, you know, hasn't improved your quality of life. Why don't they overthrow him? Oh. Making them unpopular with local civilians. North Korea's reserve force is over 150,000 stronger than the U.S.'s, reflecting the North Korean constitution, which enshrines every North Korean's duty to the military in law. However, I reservists see. receive no official training upon release from the military, and it's completely unknown how realistic North Korea's ability to mobilize and arm the 600,000 reservists truly is. Given the horrible conditions inside the military, it's also unknown how many would even answer the call to mobilize, forcing North Korea to expend significant resources simply trying to gather up its reservists in the first place. By comparison, American reservists receive regular training, typically one weekend a month and two weeks a year. U.S. reserves also regularly receive combat deployments, both to supplement the active duty force and to ensure skills and competency remain sharp. The U.S. reserve program is a well-oiled machine. Com I mean, right now, this is looking like a landslide victory for the USA, unless in the video, which I suspect there's going to be a trump card, some, some kind of, you know, nuclear weapon that North Korea has up its sleeve, because right now it's just, it's not even a contest. It's not competitive. <laughs> ...on its own. America's reserve force is a match for most military powers. There's one glaring exception to the state of North Korean training and readiness, and that's its vast special forces cadre. It's estimated that North Korea has around 200,000 special forces soldiers, making it the largest special forces in the world. By comparison, only about 3% yeah, well of the entire U.S. They? military is designated as being a part of its most elite force. The quality of its special forces has some variation. But overall, these soldiers have shown a high degree of proficiency and training, okay. taking part in ongoing infiltrations and operations against the South since the late 1960s. They have also been observed okay. carrying very modern equipment, which would not be found anywhere else in the North Korean military, including night and thermal vision equipment, armored vests, and other pieces of sophisticated kit. North Korean special forces are broken down into various roles. Its most elite soldiers are known as Lightning Commandos, and they're meant to directly counter American Navy SEALs and South Korean Navy Special Warfare Flotilla operatives. These are the elite of the elite, and are primarily tasked with foiling American and South Korean special forces operations against the North Korean military and the civilian leadership itself. Airborne Commandos utilize Antonov AN-2 planes with the task of infiltrating the South in case of hostilities. While the Antonov AN-2 is antiquated, it has the advantage of being slightly more difficult to track on radar than a modern plane due to its material construction, and the plane excels on taking off and landing on very rough runways, perfect for a quick infiltration into the South. I need to watch a video about like the history of North Korea, like why they split, what like I'm guessing there was one Korea right at one point and then they split into the North and the South. Why, why did the split happen? While all North Korean special forces are designed to create a second front in the enemy's rear, the airborne component is specifically suited to that task, quickly infiltrating past the front line to cause general chaos in the rear areas. The light infantry component of North Korean special forces is unique for its lack of any heavy equipment whatsoever. True to its role, this force is meant to infiltrate into the enemy's rear through concealed movement and then target lines of communication and high-value targets, such as air defense equipment, command and control nodes, etc. To accomplish this, they can carry only light arms and anti-tank weapons. It's even believed that they don't carry any actual body armor, instead oh wearing Kevlar vests akin to the second-chance vests many police officers around the world utilize. Maritime SOF 
are designed to infiltrate South Korea's coastline and launch attacks against vulnerable rear-area military and civilian targets. It's believed that North Korea can deliver as many as 7,000 commandos to South Korea beaches through the use of a vast fleet of midget submarines and 24 Romeo-class diesel-electric submarines specifically designed to deliver commandos onto enemy beaches. The rugged coastline of South Korea makes it very difficult to counter these submarines, and it's believed that in just one lift, the North could deliver 5,000 of these operators into the South. Reconnaissance brigades, also known as sniper brigades, are the type you're likely to be the most familiar with. These elite operators are tasked with gathering intelligence behind enemy lines but are also trained in direct action missions. They're meant to destroy or seize strategic targets from South Korean or American forces, and it's these operators who carry out assassination missions in the region. North Korea's Air Force numbers at just shy of a thousand aircraft, the vast majority of which are- I just find it really funny that North Korea can afford a thousand aircraft. Obviously, they've not got the best aircraft, but still they've got a thousand aircraft but it's people are living on like rice and corn, you know, they're starving and stuff like that. It just doesn't really seem like a good use of uh, funds, like, because you can bet that, you know, Kim Jong-un is, he he's not eating rice and corn. He's probably eating, you know, caviar and f like lobster every day. Hopelessly antiquated. The nation still operates the MiG-17, MiG-19, MiG-21 and MiG-23 fighters with a few MiG-29s. They may also have a small number of MiG-25s, though this is hotly debated. The nation's most numerous fighter is the MiG-21, <clears throat> an obsolete yet still capable platform. However, the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency concluded that the North Korean Air Force could not prevail against U.S. forces due to, quote, overwhelming advantages in power projection, yeah, like strategic air superiority, and precision-guided standoff strike area. capability. The USDIA also stated that the North would have a significant difficulty operating against the South's air defense capability. North Korea does have one of the densest air defense systems in the world, given America's overwhelming use of air power. However, the bulk of its air defenses are made up of Cold War era SA-5 Gammon and domestically produced Pongge 5 SAMs. During Desert Storm, Iraq had one of the best air defense systems in the world, and it was systematically dismantled by Allied air power. In conflict against America, North Korea's even older and less capable air defense network would be no easy prey to Not superior U.S. technology and tactics. The use of stealthy F-22s, F-35s, B-2s, and soon the B-21 would further reduce the effectiveness of North Korea's defenses. The North's army operates 6,645 tanks versus America's 5,500, minus 31 or so recently sent off to Ukraine. According to South Korean intelligence, the North's tank fleet is primarily made up of obsolete T-34s, T-54s, T-55s, T-62s, and... Speaking of the whole Ukraine thing, isn't it interesting how, you know, the media, at least in England, have basically stopped talking about it? Yeah, I, I, I don't know what's happening there. I don't know who is winning, if you can, you know, win a conflict like that. I guess unless you're really following it, you know, through maybe telegram channels and or, or, you know, or whatever. I just, I don't know how people, what's going on? I don't even know. These type 59s. There's also considerable doubt as to the readiness of the North's armored forces. Given the significant age of most of its inventory, it's doubtful many of them are even in an operational state today. Domestically made Chon Ma Ho tanks are believed to be a copy of the Soviet T-62 with similar capabilities, while the Pok Pong Ho its most recent addition appears to be an attempt to replicate the Soviet T-72. North Korea's tank forces are not seen as a credible threat by either the US or the South, with the bulk of its forces even if operational being easy prey even to ROK or US infantry fighting vehicles. North Korea knows it has never been able to match the US and the South militarily though, which is why it's invested in asymmetrical threats like cyber warfare, special uh -huh. forces, and nuclear weapons right. to deter or Here win a potential the war card. before the U.S. can fully enter the conflict. Where North Korea does shine, and partly as a reflection of this strategy, is in its artillery force. Previously, we've called artillery heavy armies insurance for dumb militaries when comparing the composition of the Russian military versus NATO ones. The adage holds true, the Russian military is absolutely awful at its job, but with truly overwhelming amounts of artillery, Russia has managed to level the playing field against a military a fraction of the size of its own. 
Despite the adoption of precision-guided munitions and a few other innovations, artillery largely remains unchanged since World War II. It's all about shooting high explosives from really far away as fast as possible. Thus, artillery can be the great equalizer for a dumb military. Thus, North Korea employs nearly 13,000 pieces of artillery wow. versus the U.S.'s 4,400. Almost Despite three to being one. the most powerful military in the world, the U.S. operates a shockingly small artillery force, and that's because of its doctrine of utilizing precision air power for the role. Yet the staggering... Mm. I guess, yeah, it makes sense, because if, uh, you know, artillery, like sh shelling, it's not very accurate, is it? Because these things aren't laser-guided, whereas, you know, if you can fly a plane above it with a precision, you know, like laser-guided missile that's almost guaranteed to hit the target, it's better, isn't it, really? It's more effective. ...of artillery operated by North Korea presents a significant challenge of its own, and the South trains extensively in utilizing aircraft and counter-battery fire to destroy Northern artillery. With the South's capital, Seoul, being well within range of a large amount of the North's artillery, North Korea's trump card has always been the ability to level significant portions of the city with concentrated artillery fire in the opening hours of hostilities. Good intelligence on the North Korean Navy and its capabilities is shockingly difficult to verify. Given the extreme lengths the North has gone to to keep its navy out of the limelight, it's known that the North's navy is a Greenwater Navy, or a coastal force with little capability to project power far from its own shores. It's also mostly made up of submarines, meant to blockade southern ports in case of a war, or deliver huge amounts of infiltrating special forces through the use of a mini armada. But they must know that they wouldn't stand a chance against you know, any decent-sized Western power. Like, they must know that. Like, so all of this stuff that they're doing, that these, these you know, antiquated aircraft and, and tanks, like, they must know that they would get destroyed. So what's the point of it? I guess they kind of have to have a military. To, so, you know, maybe it's for appearances, but do they really, cons are they actually really going to, are they thinking they'll ever have to actually use them in a war? Pfft. Or maybe they're delusional. Maybe they genuinely think that they could win just through willpower. Like Midget submarines. North Korea's submarine fleet is designed specifically to complicate U.S. military response and hold southern shipping at risk. And despite being largely made up of obsolete Cold War era boats like the Whiskey, Romeo, Yugo, and Hungnam class subs, they can be surprisingly difficult to locate when powered down and lurking in ambush. Nearly all North Korean submarines, even its smaller Yono class, which are designed to infiltrate small groups of special forces, have the capability of laying mines, further complicating the naval environment around the peninsula. A growing arsenal of long-range missiles could give the North subs the ability to threaten both land and sea targets, though it's unknown just how effective these attacks would be against modern air defenses. North Korea also operates two light frigates of the Najin class, with one being modernized in 2014 and a small fleet of corvettes armed with anti-ship missiles. It also operates a small fleet of missile and torpedo boats, meant to quickly strike targets before disengaging. The most recent acquisition is the Nongo class stealth missile boat, a catamaran style design with Where some stealthy characteristics to reduce its radar Russia, signature. Probably, right? Against an American fleet of 484 ships, including 11 supercarriers, 9 amphibious assault carriers, 68 submarines, 92 destroyers, and 22 corvettes, the North's Not Navy has close. no chance. But it wasn't designed to win a stand up fight. Rather, the North's main focus is to inflict a high cost on any responding American naval forces or on those of the South itself. Just how effective it would be at doing this is in serious doubt, though, given the U.S.'s vast ISR capabilities and long-range targeting. The only credible threat the North has is its fleet of 35 diesel-electric submarines, which can lurk in ambush on battery power and can be very difficult to identify in shallow waters. North Korea's greatest weapon is its growing arsenal of nuclear bombs. It's believed that the North has around 100... So they do have nuclear weapons? Oh, snap nuclear weapons in its arsenal today, and has test-fired missiles which place the entire continental United States under threat. However, its arsenal of long-range missiles is likely extremely limited and not sufficient to overcome the U.S.'s ballistic missile defenses, both in theater, across the Pacific, and on the homeland itself. The real threat of the North's nuclear arsenal is a short-range attack against the South or even Japan. 
with fears that the North could infiltrate portable nuclear weapons into the South's major harbors and detonate them in place, significantly slowing down America's ability to transport forces from across the Pacific into South Korea and causing massive civilian casualties. North Korea remains completely militarily outclassed by the US and South Korea, but it's a foe that's made its own inevitable defeat even more painful than ever thanks to the arsenal of nuclear weapons and estimated 5,000 tons of chemical agents. Now go check out what North Korea versus USA war would actually- So as we suspected, the uh, the USA would pretty much, I don't want to say wipe the floor with North Korea, but um, it would it would win for sure. Like, yes, there would be losses on both sides. You know, the USA would obviously lose some aircraft. It would lose some uh, seafaring ve uh, vessels for sure. But, you know, it's just the, you know, just in terms of the, uh, the, the vehicles at the disposal of the USA, it just would, it's not close, it's not close. But I think, yeah, that like, as the narrator said, it's the issue that, you know, I don't think North Korea actually want to win. I think they know they can't. They just want to inflict as much damage to the opponent as a deterrent. Kind of like saying, you know, you know, you if you want, you can come at us, but we will leave you scarred, essentially. So, I don't know. I just kind of feel bad for the people of North, of North Korea because, obviously, I'm sure publicly... They will, they will profess nothing but, you know, undying loyalty to the leader, Kim Jong-un. They, they'll, they'll never say anything bad about him publicly. But, and, and to be fair, because I, I hear that internet connection, like internet availability in North Korea is really limited. Like basically zero, you know, media from outside of the country, I don't think is allowed in. So maybe the people genuinely don't know any better, but they must, they must know that, in the outside world, people are living very different lives, you know, arguably much better lives. So I don't know, like, I kind of feel bad for them, like hearing that they're starving, you know, that they don't have much to eat, like living on rice and corn kernels. And that's if they're lucky. Yeah, that, that was sad. Thanks for watching, guys. And I'll see you in the next one.